Hello and welcome to our MTA Facebook Live business series. I am Jessica Pottermule, the lead instructor for the career development course here at the Nutritional Therapy Association. And I am absolutely thrilled to be here today with Emily Schramm. Uh, Emily Schramm is a personal trainer, she is a nutritional therapy practitioner, and she's an entrepreneur helping others empower themselves by way of food and movement. In addition to running online strength and nutrition programs at emilyschramm.com, her other projects include her backpack turn weight training bag, The Mpack, her podcast, The Meathead Hippie, her holistic tea line, Herbal Element, and her newest venture on Clear Skin, the Body Awareness Project. We are also thrilled to have Emily joining us speak at the MTA's Business Summit in Austin, Texas, September 29th and 30th. Emily, thank you so much for joining us. I am just so excited about this. You are just so impressive. Like you have all of these incredible ventures that you're doing and I just really appreciate you uh, coming on and taking the time to be here with us today. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here and I'm really excited to talk about kind of the stage of business because it was so new to me. Um, I actually created my first product when I was going through nutritional therapy school. So there was lots of ties with the testing and prototyping that mm -hmm. happened throughout the midterms. And so it was just it's just super fun to be able to chat about all of the good things. That's awesome. I love it. Well, my first question would be, so between running your online strength and nutrition programs, you know, as we said in your intro, you're also managing your podcast, The Meathead Hippie, you have three different product ventures. So my first question to you is just, how do you find the time to do it all? Yeah, and I'm also actually opening a gym next month in Denver. Wow. So there's really been a lot. And I think the best advice is just, um, when it's time to have help, I think, you know, a lot of people that are healers or creative entrepreneurs are really just trying to give people good information. We tend to be so good in person. I think everyone I experienced in the curriculum and in the program that I went through with nutritional therapy, we are all empaths in some way. So we feel deeply and we just want to help. But in turn, it's very rare to find people that are very creative and very, um, and I can't say it doesn't exist, but also very good at details yeah. and very logistical pieces. And so even if you can do it, but it's not something that comes natural to you, I have found that when I was able to delegate those things to the people that were helping me or willing to help, uh, I was able to open up white space for me to keep creating and for me to keep growing. And that's the biggest thing is kind of finding the time when it is helpful to bring someone on, but even sometimes five hours a week of organizing paperwork can make you available 20 hours a week to do what you do best. And so that's a huge piece of um, what I'm working on now. And I have about 12 people that I work with and that help me with various things. And without them, none of this would be possible. And so that's the biggest takeaway is that, you know, it seems like so much and it is a lot, but it's also for me, myself, I don't do, you know, I do the the parts that are of creating. I do the parts of um, research and development. And then I also do the parts that are really fun for me. And it took a while to get to that point, but delegating some things off when the time is right is really important. Man, what an incredibly valuable lesson for a practitioner who's even just one-on-one -on -one in private practice. This would be an applicable lesson for once the practice gets to the point where they need to bring on some help. And I think that's, I love that you brought that up right out, the, right out of the gate because sometimes we feel like we should be able to do it all or that we wanna do it all. But I love hearing that even if you're hiring somebody just five hours a week, that can actually free up multiple times that of your own creative bandwidth, your own mental white space. Wow. So thank you so much for sharing that. That's really helpful. Of course, and I was just thinking even one of my first ways of having someone help me applicable to somebody that is already a nutritionist or a consultant is really the pieces of giving them, sending them the nutri -Cue instead of you having to send them or uh, compiling all their information into one place and just making it really effortless for when you sit down to talk to that person, you're there a hundred percent because somebody else was able to put it all together in a place and you can just be who you are with that person. So that's just a simple, easy way to kind of free up a lot of time. Yeah. 
such a great example. Thank you. Yeah. And the next thing I'd love to know is if you can walk us through your decision and your journey of supplementing your practice with different product offerings, because I know that as you mentioned, you know, you were, as you were even going through the program, you were kind of starting in that realm of product development. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that timeline and that progression and transition for you. Yeah, so it was kind of twofold. I mean, I've been online training uh, and in person as a trainer for almost seven and a half years. And so started off at just a gym here in Denver and then just grew accidentally online, but it still was a really great fit where I just was giving um, you know, as much as I could for people that were working out at home. So that was a big problem that I kept seeing is when I wanted to give people at home workouts, I would always say dumbbells only. So the 21 day MFIT challenge that I run is so based on giving people access to workouts that are 20 minutes or less and dumbbells only. And that was a problem because most people don't realize that when they have dumbbells, as they get stronger, they obviously have to increase weight to see results, especially in short workouts. And so in order to see great results with short workouts, you have to go heavier than you probably think. So I was having people getting five pound or seven and a half pound dumbbells, which is sometimes a great place to start. But if I really want them to hit that next level and feel the workout um, progress them in the way that I wanted them to see, and also for them to see, they had to go heavier. So that was one problem that I had that I kept seeing, but I really didn't know the solution to that. And then I was traveling in 2014, and I was at in California at a hotel, and there was no gym. And I was so frustrated because I just didn't want to do another bodyweight workout. As much as I love bodyweight workouts, and they can be great, again, strength training and weight training is really how you change and sculpt your body. So not just physically, but emotionally, what that did for me, when I was able to lift something heavy overhead, it was such a, I am capable of anything moment, that superhero moment I always talk to my clients about. Uh, that was something that I was like, I have to learn how to weight train on the go. And so those two product, those two uh, um, problems really became the motivation behind how can I do this? How can I create this? And which led me to creating the MPAC, um, which is the a backpack turned weight training bag. And it was so nice because it was like, I mean, it was so a whirlwind of feelings, a whirlwind of, should I do this? Is this, this what am I, I'm so crazy. All I've done is sell, sold t-shirts and my programs online. And now I'm going to have a product. And at first that was terrifying, but then it quickly turned into the best thing I've ever done because I think especially in nutrition and health and somewhat of a saturated market, it is so nice to take a step back and have a product represent everything I believe in, strength training and health and travel and adventure, but it didn't have to be Emily Schramm. And that was something that was really powerful for me to kind of tap in into that it was an accident you know I was just trying to solve a problem but then that was that's really what kind of lit the match of like okay I really love creating things and I want to create more and more products uh, I don't want to just create more programs online let me give something somebody can hold because when people would unopen their MPAC and they got their Kickstarter pledge and then I started seeing people work out with it and you know now we have I mean it's just incredible so it's just something that I really accidentally got into but it, I was so obsessed with it and I um, I can't wait to help people try to figure out if that's a good fit for them to create their own thing oh, oh I, I, it really it's really scrapped up it's kind of what, kind of what you're yes. you have that problem yourself as a trainer and wanting to find a solution for that and what a beautiful way to bring something into existence like what you're talking about so um, that's that's awesome and and I love that, you know, that sort of lit that fire under you. And then here it spirals into so many other awesome ventures that you have now. Um, and would you say that, so you, you had meant, alluded a little bit to like selling t-shirts uh, prior to the unpack. Mm -hmm. So would you say that product development has always been something that you've kind of been interested in? Can you tell us a little bit about even like that t-shirt situation that, that you had had even prior to the unpack? Yeah, I mean, I always created t-shirts. I mean, when I first decided to be on my own as a trainer, the only way I was able to pay bills was to create I Am My Own Superhero and Be Your Own Superhero t-shirts. So that was actually just a way for me to say, 
I don't really know what I'm doing and I don't have a huge clientele base, but if I'm going to step out on my own, I want to create things that somebody could purchase and, and wear and represent. And that was such an easy thing. And I, I think that it was just, um, it didn't feel super special. Like it just felt like, really fun. So t-shirts, I think if you have a fun saying or you have a beautiful logo um, and if you have an audience and that's a great first step to dabble in, there's so many different things that you can do with t-shirts and apparel and even coffee mugs. Uh, but I think any expression of creativity for me is something that makes me very happy. And so product development, I think is an expression that I didn't know was very creative, but now it has become something that's always been inside me. And I'm just lucky enough to be at the point where I'm able to do that. Oh, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. And so after you put out that first major product launch, that unpack, what would you say were some of the biggest lessons that you learned after launching that, that you could then take on and apply to your later ventures? Mm, that's a great question. Well, I did this really funny uh, game. So I work with Girls Inc. of Metro Denver. They're just a great after school program for young girls. And we talked about kind of launching your own business and what to do if you have an idea. And I just kind of made this game because I was like, how do you explain this? You know, how do you get somebody to really get motivated enough, but never give up on it if they really believe in it? Because so many times what I found when I first started is that I had never had a product before. I was definitely a female trying to enter into not only a backpack industry, but a workout industry, and which is already male dominant. So there was two kind of things where every time I would find a designer or a potential designer, just nobody would take me seriously. And I think that's something that you have to get really used to, uh, especially if you're not quite sure what you want to do or where it's going to go. Um, and I was always honest about that. Like, I don't know. I think this is a great idea. But deep down, I just knew if I was stubborn enough and I just kept asking and asking and asking the right people, that was the biggest step is finding someone that could take what was in my head and make it real. Uh, even if it was a prototype. And what I found was it took somebody seeing the crappiest, ugliest sewn piece of bag for them to realize that I was serious. It wasn't just this idea that was on paper. It was I had taken the initiative to find somebody to sew it. And that was what I was going to go to my designers with. And when they saw that, that was kind of this, oh, okay, so this person's serious about it. Because everyone has ideas. Everyone has you know, this kind of plan written down, but to take an actual idea and just start the step of making it physical and tangible, that's what people want to make, um, to take you seriously. So I think that was the first step. So I had them, the girls walking around blindfolded, like asking different people, like, are you my next step? Are you my next step? And if they said no, they had to go find the next person because everybody will tell you no. I mean, there's just, it's too expensive, it's too hard or, it, you know, and so I think that was the first step is just make sure people take you seriously. And that was something I, I learned very quickly. So when I turned it into my tea company, um, I had all of the bags lined up. I knew exactly what I wanted in them and they had all been tested. And that was the next piece is making a lot of feedback from your friends, from your family. If you're a nutritional therapist, if you're a practitioner or consultant, if you have worked as a personal trainer, those clients become your test clients. They become the people that say, you have to keep trying this. You, you get feedback as much as possible. I think that was the biggest thing is, would this be something that somebody would actually buy? You know, I think it's a great idea, but if I can give it to my clients and my clients say, I would, I would use this. I like this. This is a great idea. And I think as much as I love my mom and my family, it is important to get outside of your bubble because they will think everything you do is God gifted. <laughs> uh, but that was huge. It was like the more I could have people test, not just if this is going to work, but it became the feedback for exactly what I wanted the first prototype or the first product, um, the first edition to look like. So it was just people, is this an idea that people would really respond well to and asking everyone in your circle, plus more to help give feedback and be really open to that critique. I think that's hard because it's like you have an idea, but I promise you if you just take the critique and criticism and fix it, you can. It's better to do it in the in the development stage than it is to launch the product and get the feedback on the reverse end. So those two pieces, I think, um, never taking no for an answer and just getting really stubborn and just if the door says, if the designer said, nope, I'm not doing this, 
I don't have the time or energy. You just go to the next person. You just constantly ask people until somebody, you know, I got really lucky. I find, found, I figured out who I wanted and I just called him until he said yes. So it was just something you got to be really stubborn um, when you believe in it, but believe in it because it's so cool to have a product. Oh, such gems of advice. Like what total, total gems of advice. And it's funny because I wouldn't, I hadn't even considered that it was a male dominated industry and be that being a female was, uh, you know, in, in this space, a little bit new in the product development space, that that would be something that was working against you. So what great insight and also countering that with what can you do? You can show them that it's actually, you're not, you know, you're, you're being serious. Here's my prototype. This is what I want. So that's uh, just such great lessons and also lessons that are applicable to with any sort of uh, any sort of product development or service development. Like you were saying, getting that feedback, mm-hmm. listening to what people are saying and not taking it too personally, which can be hard when you've created something. It's like your baby, you know, it's like an extension of yourself. You, you don't want to hear people criticizing it, but being open to that feedback and being open to iterating if needed, you know, as a result of that feedback, just such, such gems of advice. So thank you for that. Say, of course. I will say though, in product development stage, perfectionism mm-hmm. will always be your blockage. Like yeah. so many people that if it's not perfect, it's not worth putting out there. But that's the beauty about product development is that if you looked at, you know, I don't have, I can't prove this, but I'm sure Patagonia first backpack was nowhere near how beautiful and complex it is. And even only being a year and a half in to my company with Evolve Motion, there, you know, we're already on three versions that when I look at version one, I'm like, oh my God, this is so bad. This is so ugly. I can't believe I sold this to people, but it still served its purpose and people love it and use it. And it just gets better and better and better over time. And so I think that sometimes um, the biggest thing is understanding when your perfectionism and like your need to make it so absolutely perfect will be actually the reason that this product doesn't get live. And so uh, that's when other people are really important to kind of say it is perfect as is with the price point, et cetera. It can always get better. That's the beautiful thing about businesses is it always, always, always is evolving. Oh, I love that you brought this up too. This is definitely something that we go over in the career development course as well, because when practitioners are new as well, starting their practice, trying to identify their target market, you know, trying to really hone in on, on branding and things like that can be feel really scary. And it can, that perfectionism, I think, can creep in for all of us um, so, so easily. And we kind of talk to this uh, this idea of sort of failing fast and failing forward, because as soon as you kind of get it out there, as soon as you create that first thing, yes, it probably won't be perfect. But then as the quicker you do that, the faster you're going to get to those other iterations that are even better and better and better, but it doesn't happen until you start and until you just dig in. So what a great thing to touch on and such an important lesson. I can absolutely see how that would be so pervasive in product development too, because it's such a tangible thing that you're like, this isn't exactly how I would want for it to be. Like with the T's, they have to, those had to be perfect. Yeah. Um, but definitely there was a point with backpacks, it's a very high price item. So yeah. backpacks and T's totally different because T's, I knew exactly what it, the blend should taste like. And if it was a little bit off, I wouldn't put it out there into the world. Right. So right. It was, different to manipulate but with backpacks since they're so expensive and depending on your manufacturer and manufacturing costs and your minimums and those are kind of the big questions with product development is that any little additional zipper or even padded straps was an extra ten dollars to the bag Mm -hmm. and so it got to the point where you had to decide like okay what is an absolute must for this first version and what can i add to the list for the next version when I'm able to. So knowing kind of the difference between like it's totally okay to make something like be that psycho that wants it like to the mill- milligram of the right chamomile in the tummy tonic, but um, also keeping in, in mind that the cost is really going to be the reason that you don't get it to the exact level that you want. Uh, and that's okay. Cause that'll come, come with time. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Great clarification there. Um, and so can you share, I know that you already have, but any, anything else you can speak to in terms of some of the strategies that you've used for getting a product development idea off the ground. So like somebody has this, I has this idea, let's say for our listeners who might be interested in creating a product of their own, 
um, what would you say would be sort of those first few steps between I have an idea, what can I do with it? Where should I go with it? Yeah, I think the first thing again is to test it, test it with yeah. a lot of people, get feedback from a lot of people. Um, you know, if you're at the point where it's not just friends and family and you're like, okay, what is the next step? Then you can always do um, ra like random people picking five people to taste. I'm trying to think of an example, like with backpacks, I would give it to boot camps and I would have them work out with it and see their feedback. And then I also with teas, it was like, really let, let me see on a scale of one to 10, do is this tea unique enough to put in a very saturated market? Cause teas for me, I mean, it was just such a, there's so many teas and there's so many herbs. So I think that I had to make sure that it was super special before I launched it. Um, so I think the first thing is making sure the feedback is there, making sure it's unique enough. That's the thing is if it's a, you know, if it's a something that you can find on Amazon quickly for half the price, that's really hard for a customer to kind of commit to. They're always going to pick the, sh the easier option unless there's a really good story behind it. So you yourself have to be the spokesperson, regardless of your business, regardless of what field you're in. Um, people more and more, I think, as spread out as we get with social media, the more and more people want to come home to something. They want to connect to somebody and something. And so you have to have a good story. And so I think it's um, being very verbal with that. Like, this is who I am. This is my idea. Whether that means you take pre-orders. I know a lot of companies can launch products via pre-orders uh, just as long as they explain who they are and why they created the product. That's really important. But then I did for the Evolve Motion for the backpack, for MPAC, I use Kickstarter. And Kickstarter became a really great way for me to say, you know, I've already have invested a lot of money into this because I had to get it prototyped. Um, I had to get it tested and I had to get a designer to get to this point. But Kickstarter became a great way for me to launch it with my platform. So that was awesome. Um, but you can also just start with small batches. So finding companies that are able to do, depending on the product, if it's a consumer packaged good, that becomes a little harder because the minimums are so big. You know, there's just constant, you know, it's a, if it's a food product, then you're probably going to need to make it in a commercial kitchen somewhere in your city and you're going to have to probably go to farmer's markets to finally get to the the demand that you can get um, to grow. And so for me, instead of farmer's markets, I would do boot camps in Denver and then I also would do um, fit expos. So anything that was related in the fitness world, especially in Denver, or if I could go outside of Colorado, I would just go right to where the audience was. Where are the people that want fitness and they clearly love travel and they love adventure? That's my audience to get this to. And so sometimes um, that's just finding the right niche. Like where are those people meeting and how can I set up a booth uh, depending on what I can afford. Sometimes farmer's markets are the best place to start. Uh, I had a really good friend that launched her product through farmer's markets, and I know a ton of people that do that. And that's great because you can do at least three to four a week, um, or you can just stick with one a week, and it would be a stretch of time. Obviously, it's a big time commitment, um, but it's a really good way to see if this is something people are well-received. Are they are they interested in this? You can build up your newsletter. So that's huge because you want to stay connected. You want to build a community. You want to talk to them some about maybe nutrition, but also now we have this product to kind of become synonymous with that uh, nutrition education. And then you can start from there. So that was probably, I think those are all like little avenues to start dabbling. Um, but again, it's also, you know, dependent on textile versus food. Food is definitely a little bit, uh, easier on a small scale, but as soon as you get a little bit bigger, that becomes a little trickier. And so, but I also think everything is possible. Mm -hmm. That's great. That, that, that goes directly into the next question that I was going to ask you, which was, so after you developed the product, after you launched it, I'd love to hear some of the marketing strategies that you found to be most effective or that you would suggest for people. I know that you just kind of mentioned even some ways of, of getting the feedback. That's also feeds into that marketing channel, right? Sort of that grassroots movement. Do you feel that grassroots is really a great way to go that in your experience, or are there any other marketing venues that you can speak to um, that you would recommend or have found success with? Yeah, I think they all have their place. You know, I think the best thing to do is depending on your product, um, there's got to be a story behind that product. So it's not just for example, my teas, it's not just how to brew the teas. 
for the M pack for the backpack, it's not just here's how to make it a weight training bag. It is really showing people use and drink, use the M pack and drink the teas. And so lots and lots of nights of waking up in the middle of the night of like, how can I get creative and showing this product in use? Because no matter what, when you look at a product, it's so easy to, you know, it might look really good, but I think for me, the thing that drives me crazy is kind of this like consumerism mentality and refusing to be just another product that people buy and then it just sits on the shelf or it sits in their garage. Like we all have like an ab wheel or like the thigh master or like a workout tool where we have like the full intention of using it. We have the full intention of being a better human because that's all this is. It's, all of these are tools to help me connect with my clients, right? So they're just expressions of how to give them access to feeling the best that they possibly can. And so that was the biggest thing for me is if I'm going to create this, the last thing that I'm going to do is just market it really beautifully where it sounds very appealing and it sounds very healing and it's, you know, it's the answer to everything, but now it's also the tools to how to keep them using it and how to keep them engaged and how to keep them wanting to be a part of this community that is so important in today's age. And so I just think that was the biggest piece is when I market it, you know, of course, and Instagram is amazing. The newsletter is amazing, but it's always trying to be around how can I get them involved? And the best thing is how, how can I get creative and make this tea? Um, can I use it in recipes or how can I get creative with this impact? What are some workouts? And so it's more hands-on do right now, regardless of if you have this product or not, it's still, you can still get a takeaway from it using something like a kettlebell and then eventually getting the impact. But I think that that's the biggest piece is, with marketing strategy, it is so much more about, for me, whether this is accurate or, or not, or whether this is the best approach or not, is getting them to actually integrate it into their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what a beautiful kind of heart-centered place that you come from, that you're speaking to, in terms of really, these, are, these products are ways that you mentioned that you are able to connect with your clients. And I just really love... Um, I love the approach that you take with that. And I'm sure that weaves right into the story, right? Behind behind your own products. And um, I just think that's such a beautiful way to approach things um, and, and bring things to market. So thank you so much for sharing that. That's really awesome. And for those that are listening who are considering complementing their practice with product development, I know we already talked about some really great first steps that you had mentioned, but is there anything else that you kind of wish you had known um, before, right at the outset there or that, you know, if you had a friend who was just kind of considering moving into this venture, anything else that you feel like you'd like to share with them? Um, yeah, I think <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, everything that has happened Every bump and every mess up, I think, always is a really good lesson. So there's been no regrets as far as anything that's come along. I think, um, you know, I, I hate to say this. I don't want, even want to say this, but I think the biggest thing is, you know, your it is your baby. It is an extension of you, and uh, nobody will take it as seriously as you do. I mean, there's very few people in my life that I could trust doing what I do with the product and seeing the growth that I want. So you have to keep that in mind. I tend to be, um, I tend to want my message to come off as clear as possible, but there will always be people that don't really get your message and then misuse that. And so I think that's the biggest thing is just be really clear about your intentions with the product and align yourself with people that do not give you any icky feelings. And yeah. that's hard to do because you just have to find the manufacturer that can say yes to a small amount. Um, you, so, you know, you just have to find the right person at that right time. But it is so important to listen to your gut when it comes to how a person makes you feel. If they are in any way associated with your business, whether it's, you know, tying on, uh, tying on the straps to the MPAG or putting on the tags or packaging and putting stickers on the tee. I just am such a believer in energy. And like, if you feel like that's, that person doesn't really get it or that person's in it for the wrong reasons or they don't really see your vision, um, be really careful with that. You know, sometimes it, it might require you working with them for a little bit, but as soon as you can move on to somebody that sees your vision, just surround yourself with every single person that is like, yes, I get it. And I'm gonna do everything I can to help you on your journey. 
And that energy is so important when it comes to how you feel about the product, even on your worst sales days, you know, if or months, if you go through a month and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is like, <gasps> but that energy from all the people that are in your life that are believing in you as a human, believing in, in you as an entrepreneur, um, believing in you as a nutritionist, I think that really goes a long way. And so trust your gut when it comes to the people that feel like they're in it for the wrong intentions because they probably are. Oh, such, such <laughs> good advice. Such good advice. I love that intuition led way of operating a business and a way of specifically choosing who it is you're bringing into your life, into your circle, because um, you're, you're so right. You know, with there's some toxicity there with, with people who aren't in it for the right reasons alongside you, you're not all going to be aligned in that same vector working together and bringing this vision about for you as a product developer, especially from such a heart centered person as yourself, where you're leading this with so much love and so much care um, that you only want to surround yourself with people who get it and who want to, who share that same vision. So such, such, such great advice. Thank you. Yeah. And I think like the question of like, how do you get started is you have to say there's a lot of no's, there's a lot of closed doors. Um, but that's the best part is like, you have to be really stubborn, but you also just at the end of the day have to really trust who you work with. And that's hard because it's, you know, how do you trust somebody when you don't even know what you're doing? It's a brand new business and brand right. new product, but just like nutrition. And this is what I talk about in my MFIT challenges and my programs is like, if you peel back the layers, the layers of whether that's sugar or too much alcohol or too much toxins in our environment, you're able to tap into that intuition. And you, it's like a, it's really just a, a practicing thing. It's just trusting it a little bit more. So learning how to trust who you are, trust what you can, what you can bring into this world. And that does take time and it does take, take practice. And it does take a lot of like, oh, why did I work with that person? But it always will end up being, you know, if your intentions are pure, it always will end up um, becoming a good life lesson down the road. That's awesome. And I'd love to also hear a little bit more. I know we've touched on, um, you know, the MPAC and the T-Line a little bit more, but I'd also love for you to dig in to the Body Awareness Project and a little bit more about what you're doing there. Um, as somebody personally who dealt with cystic acne before uh, before digging into nutritional therapy, um, I when I saw you were coming out with this, I was like, yes, this is amazing. Tell me more. So I'd really love for you to uh, go into that a little bit more detail for our listeners. Of course. Um, and I'm so honored to be a CEU for Nutritional Therapy Association. Ah. I'm so grateful for that. So um, with the Body Awareness Project, so I had this MFIT challenge, which was 21 days, $21, basically snack bite pieces of information to kind of build someone's own you know, knowledge of how to build a plate and how to live life in this new lifestyle, like how to make this realistic. And so we would dabble in some nutritional therapy concepts, but at a very small level. And I like that, but I also always want more because there's always somebody that needs a little bit more um, push into why, the root cause, right? We can't fix anything or we can't support anything unless you understand the root cause. And th that takes a lot of digging. And so when I was thinking about, for me, the body awareness moment I had was when I understood that food connected to my acne. And I had struggled yeah. with acne my whole life. I mean, I 10, 11, 12, 13, I was so young and put on birth control and all the heavy prescription creams and just constantly so um, I was just a different human because I hated who I looked like in the mirror. And that was a big piece of it is because of my skin. Mm -hmm. and anyone who suffers from acne knows. Yes. Um, and so that was just the first kind of, if I could create something that really represented how to heal and help people stop taking these horrible things that can really affect our, our body, our bio, like our chemistry inside, like we have to learn um, in a safe way, how to help heal our acne. And so that's why the Body Awareness Project came to be. And then I just launched the part two because it is all about adrenals and cortisol, which is something I'm always walking the line on as a business owner of five companies. I'm just, I'm, I'm like, I'm so, I feel like I've somewhat, you know, the moment I say I master it, I tend to like go off the wagon. But for the most part, there's all these tools and ways to navigate um, when your body is just 
in overdrive. You know, when you are a business owner, when you are trying to get clients, when you're trying to just have a foundation of safety, right? That's a, a need. That's a necessity. That's our root chakra is feeling financially stable. And when that's off balance, because we're trying to create a new career, we're switching careers and we're following our passion. That is terrifying. That can rock us um, in really big ways. And we start to see that manifest with obviously skin can be one. And then also just our, our uh, sleep becomes horrible. Our results in the gym, or we also can go the opposite way and start getting a lot of weight gain. And so I'm trying to help people navigate that. So tangent um, ending, the Body Awareness Project is an educational course on one topic and then plus a box of curated goods that comes with it. So it's a really good way to just get the box and start your healing journey as you're learning with hours and hours of content from all these experts about why your body might not be doing what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. Love it. So empowering and just such a beautiful message and, and way to present that to people. And it's also gorgeous. I've seen, I've seen I'm like, this is stunning. I love it. I love it. So um, yes, thank you so much for taking the time again with us today and for all that you do and all that you're contributing, contributing to our community. And I cannot wait to spend the weekend with you in Austin. It's September. Again, um, we are going to be down in Austin for our business summit at the NTA. And Emily is going to be one of our fantastic speakers. She's going to be diving even deeper into all things product development. So if you'd like to come spend a weekend with us, spend a weekend with Emily and um, hear even more about how you can develop your own product, I would invite you all to join us this September in Austin, Texas. You can find all of the details at our website, nutritionaltherapy.com. Uh, scroll down to our events and check out Austin and we'll be there. So thank you so, so much again, Emily. So, so appreciate you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. And thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you next time.